Uh, I know some of you personally. For those uh, who I don't know yet, my name is Dachi, as Heiko already mentioned, and I'm the founder and CEO of a company called Pulsar AI. Um, I called my slideshow today in between data fasts because uh, I was also a speaker uh, on data fast, I think it was 2017. And right after that, in about three months, we went to the US for our first, very first visit to Silicon Valley, uh, where it all started for us. That took us to this point where we uh, got acquired earlier this year, in May actually, this year by a US company called Spincar. And and it landed first Georgian uh, startup exit in the tech sector. Um, so happy to share uh, how we how we did all of this. And uh, I would actually recap what we did uh, in a sense that I can give you some kind of uh, not a recipe, but um, but a good insight of how how I think I would do this thing all over again, and what we did right and what we did wrong. So. I tried to collect all of the main insights that would probably be helpful for anyone who would uh, who who is trying to uh, start a company in Georgia and uh, go global. And uh, this is even though it's about AI, uh, I think it's applicable to any any other industry. Uh, but as far as my my experience comes from business-to-business -business company, B2B, it is mostly focused on B2B because I think that it's, um, honestly, I think it's easier to, to get there. You need less money. You have more time to uh, refine your product, to refine your idea. So my, my advice mainly would work in B2B and not probably in B2C, but I, I also have that goal in my life to build a B2C company someday in the future. So. Hopefully, some of the advices will work there as well. Um, so, uh, in between data fests, yeah, who 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 have attended data fest in 2017 might have also also noticed that I completely lost my hair, but uh, but that's not only that happened. So we we got to a good point. Uh, let me start. So, um, one of the applications of AI is in automation. Uh, so. In today's world, um, where things are shifting more to the digital world, what we see is that customers are uh, communicating with the companies with the services that they need uh, through digital channels. And not only digital channels, but the, the, um, the existence of digital channels actually uh, brings in the challenge of bigger scale, because when you are operating in digital channels, that by itself means that you have a better reach to, to the customers and customers have easier reach to you, to your company and the product, which by itself means that uh, at some point, the scale that you need to operate at is quite big, which means that if you don't automate things, you might lose the quality of the service, you might not be able to serve all of your customers, you might not be able to handle all of the uh, communication that you need, not only communication, but all of the operations are just scaling at a pace that you might not be able to catch up without bringing in automation into place. So automation has been the focus that we, um, that we chose, and uh, by, by bringing in AI into automation, companies are able to actually augment their capabilities, become from a company that can serve 100 customers to uh, unlimited number of customers, for example, if you use AI in your communications. And they are also able to offload repetitive uh, tasks to the machines, which by itself means that you're also saving costs because you don't need uh, people anymore to do repetitive tasks. You can use their knowledge, you can use, use their human judgment for harder tasks that we cannot automate as of now, and uh, let the machines do the rest, which is not, uh, which is not uh, at a level where it needs human judgment. So uh, I believe in automation, obviously, and I think that automation is, uh, is a very a uh, necessary thing in today's world, especially what we are living through right now uh, because of uh, 
working remotely, uh, buying and selling things remotely. So all of these things are getting easier and easier if automation is in place. So results are faster, more personalized uh, execution and processes, which, which means that you can take into consideration any data point that you have about a customer and react based on that, which means that you will not serve every customer in a uh, single manner, but you will be able to personalize all of the experience and services that you have uh, for uh, for each customer, which in uh, not automated world would not be possible at a scale that you need to operate. And, um, and this also allows you to use data, as I just mentioned, uh, at a very greater uh, extent, which uh, which delivers again better results for customers, better customer experience, and better results for the business itself. So overall, uh, automation helps you grow, and aut automation helps you become peer company, deliver better services in a better manner. Um, so. How do you start there? So if you, if you agree with me that you, you believe in automation, and I think you should, uh, automation uh, can be in every industry. And I think it's a hot topic in every industry, especially in the ones that are uh, also doing their business in digital. So uh, this by itself means that uh, you can basically target any industry to, to build automation products there. And uh, as, uh, as we speak about it, what you need to do in the beginning, you just need to target big industry that you think needs this technology shift right now. The, the industry that we chose wa was automotive industry. And if you go to the US, even though you're in the United States where the technology is not a new thing, um, I would not say that it's still true as of now, but like three years ago, two years ago when we were starting uh, Pulsar AI in the US, uh, automotive industry was pretty behind uh, in terms of technology adoption. Like websites you would go and see were, were crappy and they still are crappy, but all of the other technologies are pretty old. And, um, and, and not many things are done with the technology. So but this, this means that uh, in that case, um, you are looking at an industry that you know uh, now or a little bit later will still need to uh, bring in more tech into its sector. And COVID help, helped us show this to the industry even faster than we were uh, aiming for. And um, so as we, as we chose automotive industry, there were a bunch of possibilities and opportunities that we could look at. But of course, we took our main expertise into action, and it was conversational AI, because we've been doing this thing uh, since to early 2017 for Georgian companies, for banks, insurance companies. We've been building chatbots, and that was the main expertise that we had in natural language processing. So we focused on that industry, and uh, as we uh, as we focused on that, it was already quite obvious what, what, what were the uh, needs on the market. Um, the market shows you already what it needs if you talk to the right people. So when, you, when you're trying to start, when you're thinking about ideas, you probably go to entrepreneurs and investors because you think that like those are the closest people to the entrepreneurship, but they're not the right people to help you define what the product should be and help you find what the, what the company should be about. So for that, what you need to do is to go and talk to professionals that are working in those companies and those sectors where your application and your technology might be useful. So when you go to w what we did, we, we just went to a couple dealerships and talk, uh, talked to them about like, what are your needs? What are your problems today? And they told us like, okay, we're getting this thousands of leads every month that we cannot handle on time. And we are paying money per each lead, per each uh, vehicle inquiry that customer sends us asking like, does this car have uh, sunroof or can I come and see this vehicle or can I test drive it or what's the last price? So all of those questions are being unanswered and that's the problem for us. That's what we were told by the by this company. So we figured out that okay if we build a if we build a product that helps them handle those leads, they might pay for that. And the better we handle those, 
the more money they will pay for it. So that's how I think you should approach each industry. You should go and talk to executives, managers, and those people who are doing things by their hands today with their teams, and they will tell you what's their biggest challenge today, like what they think, because many ideas are born within the process, right? Within the time of whenever you see that some things are becoming repetitive and somebody else could do that, probably machine could also do that. So that's that's my biggest advice probably when you're trying to find an idea, just go and talk to people who are working in big companies who are working in hospitals, hotels, and those places where they might be able to have a better perspective than you have of what could be solved by a technology. They might be just talking about what they don't like in their company and you may catch the idea there. So that's that has been one of the best discovery for me. And I think if you are targeting, let's say, US market, it's also important to spend some time there, especially at the beginning, because uh, if you're not part of everyday life there, then you might not be able to uh, find everyday problems that they have. Because from here, what we see is the Twitter, uh, Facebook are becoming bigger, and those companies that reach us um, are not probably the best sources for us to generate new ideas. What we need to do is to go there and look at what the, what the problems are there. Because obviously when you talk to startups here in Tbilisi, the problems they are trying to solve are quite in context of Georgia. That's, and, and why is that? Because they are just here. They, they see it in their lives. They see their friends struggling with doing something and they come up with an idea. But what you need to do if you're, if you're aiming to create something for the US, then you somehow need to communicate with that people at least remotely. But you have a chance to be there, that's even better. So that's why you need being there. Otherwise, we built all our business, we built all our company, all of our uh, technology in Georgia, and we still continue to do th to do so after the acquisition. It was only me and two or three American people helping me build the business there in the U.S., and the rest of the team, more than 20 people, have been uh, working from Georgia. So you can actually build the thing, but you need to identify problems and have this business tie to the U.S. and to the bigger market by being there or at least communicating with that with that people on a daily basis because that helps you to have perspective that they have and not the perspective that you have in Georgia because it's sometimes irrelevant and you lose the main points in that uh, in that process so my biggest advice would be to get connected with the people in the industry on executive level and on management level in the industries that you're interested in so if you're interested in real estate, go ahead and talk to real estate professionals who are doing things there, because there you will find what you can help them with, with the technology. So the, uh, so, so the next thing after identifying a problem, what you need to do is to measure the need and measure the market, because that's what makes it attractive for you and that's what makes it attractive for investors as well. So if you see that, you spoke to, I don't know, five companies and you have like two ideas, go ahead and measure how many others have the same problem, what you would solve for them, would you save time for them, and would you add an add additional value to, to, the, to the business that they are uh, building. And in that case, you will be able to come up with price range of what your product might be, uh, might be worth. And in that case, what you do is you go and see how many, for, for, for us it was like how many car dealerships are there. Okay, there are like 30,000 car dealerships. Okay, can we price it in the beginning like $1,000 a month? Yes, so that's the total addressable market. $1,000 times 30,000 dealerships times 12 is the total addressable market that you could get. Of course, you will never get there, However, many things will change also. Price will increase, and if, you, if you're able to get like 10% of the market, then you're already in a good shape. So measure the market to, to understand how big is the thing that you're starting, because always, sometimes ideas are good, but 
are not critical or sometimes ideas are not taking you that far from where you are today. So probably better thing at that stage would be to measure, to measure the market and also the, to, to check the competition landscape. And when we talk about the competition, we, we always try to come up with, with the ideas that we, we think nobody has ever had in the past and there are no existing ideas like, like yours. But in our case, um, I'd mentioned this company called, uh, well, uh, I would not name it, but th there's a company that was pretty big and it's even now, it's still bigger than we are today in terms of how many customers we have, but nobody is even trying to compare products, uh, product of ours to theirs because we are far, far, better than they are today. And uh, the reason I'm, I'm mentioning this is that their existence on the market helped us go to the market faster because we were not explaining to the customers, to the potential customers, what is this about? Because they already knew that this thing is gonna take my lead that I get from the customer, it's gonna automate and send the, send the response to the customer and it's gonna do some other things, of course, but that's the main, uh, main thing it does. And um, so customers already knew it because this company has spent seven, eight years trying to take this product to the customers, they've been explaining it. And what we did then was that we hired two people who used to work in that company, we brought them to the team and asked them simple questions like, when you were trying to sell this thing to the customers, what were the main challenges? Like, what were the main things that they didn't like? And they told us, like, okay, we're not answering specific questions. We were not able to schedule appointments for them. Okay, that should be the feature that we should have in our product. And we added that to the product, and we went to the customers and told them, do you know that company? What is the thing that you don't like about them? and they would tell us the very same thing, and we would tell, okay, this is the product that we have here, it solves those two parts as well, and it costs half the price. And for us now, the easiest customers to get are the ones that are using our competitor's product. We just call them and tell them, okay, this is our product, you can compare it, these are the results that we're driving, and they are canceling our competitor's product and are moving to, to our product. So in that sense, for us, exist, uh, the existence of the competitor was probably the biggest push for us to go to the market faster and in the right way because we learned on their mistakes as well. We figured out how to demo the product because they've been trying to figure it out for a couple of years and we took their, we, we just called them, asked them to make a demo if it were, if we were like, dealership, they demoed it to us, we figured out that okay, this is the best way probably to demo it because they've been trying to discover the best way for a couple of years already. We took that and we took it to the uh, to our sales team. So by, by all of this, what I want to tell you is that customer is not barrier for you. Sometimes you can use the customer to build better thing, to go market faster and to actually deliver better results in an easier way. So. Don't be, don't be afraid if your idea is already in play in the US, for example, because the market is big and it's easy to identify whether, whether there's this market of like uh, winner takes it all or not, because there are many things that companies can have different to offer to, to the customers and there are industries where five and 10 companies are worth billions of dollars and are offering the same services to the customers. So uh, that's my next point, so that after you measure the market and you figure out that it's big, if there are already existing uh, competitors, just try to understand if they are, if the industry is winner takes it all, like Facebook, for example, or uh, Airbnb, it's hard to compete with them, but there are other industries where by slightly changing what they are offering or slightly changing the price or the process, you can still create a good product and have your uh, market share there. Uh, so the next thing, for me, I was um, in 
2015, when I was still um, trying to build my previous company, which I failed, <laughs> um, I was uh, visiting Israel uh, with the help of Jida, and um, I think it was like two weeks. Uh, actually, there were like 50 people that Jida selected and took to Israel, and I was not out of those 50, so I <laughs> took my own money and went there to, to be part of them. Uh, and, and I attended the, the course there for, for, for those two weeks. And um, I took like two or three insights from there, but those two or three insights changed the approach I had forever. And one of those uh, is fake it until you make it because there was this lecturer who showed us, have you ever seen the Dropbox video of the guy explaining the fake product? It's the original video, you can still go to Google, uh, go to YouTube and search for it. Um, don't remember his last name, but the founder is showing the product, which is not really a product, it's just a fake product as if it was working already. He just uploads this file, then downloads it, but it's just fake screens there. And he showed it to investors. No, no. Well, investors were not giving money to them. So they, and somebody advised them to like create some fake product and uh, do the validation of the idea. So they did this thing. They uh, uploaded this video and distributed it to different forums and different places. And at, at the end of the video, they're saying like, leave your email if you're interested to get the early private beta or something uh, for you. And they got like 100,000 100, or something uh, signups uh, for this newsletter on the very first day. And they went back to the same investors and they got money from there. And why did it happen? Because it's hard to explain, like even for you, it's hard to imagine what your final product will be. So imagine how hard it is to tell the others to imagine that thing, right? So go ahead and build something that on the surface looks like it is already existing so that that, that, is a, that is better medium for you to communicate what you're talking about. So for me, that has been the most favorite thing that I'm using every time I try to start something from scratch. Even today, I'm trying to start something and I'm doing the same thing. And I did the same thing when I was started, starting Pulsar together with uh, Zal, my co-founder. We, we sat down, we built this demo uh, chatbot for in Georgian language for weather, which was like telling you what's the weather in Tbilisi, but in Georgian. And we took it to TBC Bank and showed it to them. Even though it was not working the way it should be, they thought it was working. So, <laughs> and they signed the contract. That's how we got our first contract, really. Like it was like not, not even 10% was working of what we were pitching to them, but we were confident that we would do that if we had the contract, right? So it's okay to fake it as long as you are confident that you're going to do it. You should not lie, of course. You should not lie to your potential customers, to your potential teammates, and to your uh, future customers and investors, but it's okay to tell them whatever you're going to be able to deliver to them whenever they need it. So make it more real for others because that's going to help you win their confidence in you. Um, so after you have identified the problem and after you've got to the point where you're already holding something that is good to present to the others, start with small checks from friends and family. So when I say that, when I first went to uh, Silicon Valley, not first, but like when I went there, moved there to start the US venture, uh, called Pulsar after having this thing done in Georgia. We bootstrapped here, we didn't raise any money because now it's possible to raise money from investors, but back in 2016, 17, you would not be even able to explain to the others why somebody should invest their money to somebody else's company, which now is okay, and we all understand that. Uh, but that was pretty new there back, back in that time. So what we did was that we just bootstrapped, we got this contract, we would pay all of our costs with the contracts and revenue that we had. But when we went there, that's a very regular thing to go to investors and ask them for money. But 
the first thing that I, that I learned when I went there was that, okay, I need probably $1 million. And I always thought that you got to go to, to the U.S. and you um, go to somebody's room and tell them that you need $1 million. And so who's going to trust you? Like, my name is Dachi Choladze. Like, they cannot even pronounce my name. I'm trying to explain where my country is. So there are many challenges, right? So if you go and tell them that they should risk a million dollars for you, it's not going to work. But if you go to someone that already knows you and already knows how, how dedicated you are to the success and how dedicated you are to building something, then they may be able to trust you and give you $5,000 or $10,000. So that's what I learned first when I got there because... For, for the first $200,000 that we raised, we already had like 15 investors because some of them were giving 5000 some of them were giving us $10,000, and that was how it was working. But once we raised 200000 and we went back to some investors that said no, then they already thought, okay, so these guys probably are going to build something, so I may better give them $20,000 now. And once you're getting more and more money from people, you're also increasing the check size. And as we reached half a million dollar uh, raise, um, we got two checks off. One was $200,000, one was $250,000. And that's like, we got to half a million in about like two months, and then we got to one million in two months in one day because when, when you already have this critical amount of money, which already takes you to some success, then they don't want to miss out. And they see that one way or the other, you got the money. So you are probably going to also build the product because you are the one who does what, they, what he says. So that's pretty, pretty important to start it small and to start it with small checks with the people that already trust you, already know you, and already know that you are your determination is there and you're going to succeed one way or the other because in the beginning where they invest is just you because you may end up figuring out that your product is not the your idea was not 100% right but I want you to be flexible with that when I trust you with my money so that instead of me you're going to be the one who's going to work to find out which idea is better so that's the point there you got to make them believe in you and the ones that already believe you believe in you are your friends and family so that's where you should start um and after that when you have already raised the first critical amount of money then you can ask them to give you intros and they are happy to do that because they invested in you already and they want you to get more money because it secures their money as well right because if i gave you my $10,000, I want you to raise more because that way I'm, um, I'm decreasing the risk that I will lose my $10,000 that I gave you because you're going to have more money to try more things. So then they will be happy to give you intros to, to, the other com to the other potential investors who might not know you already. So that's how you start from zero and get, get, get there. And it's Pretty, pretty simple. You just need to go out and try because that also helps you practice your pitching, which is pretty important. And finally, whatever it takes. Is it a final slide? No, okay. Uh, so whatever it takes, you should get your first customer as soon as you can. Like once you have a product prototype or a demo, you should go to, a, go to the market and try to get a customer. The way I landed our first customer was that when we went to Silicon Valley first time, there was this Georgian folks evening uh, where I met George Arison, our co-founder, and I met Zaza Fochulia, our one of the investors for us. But on the on the other year, we, we went we went to the same event. There was the same evening, and some guy came who moved to the U.S. like ten years ago from Georgia, and he told me that he works in a dealership. So like with those two events, I already had a co-founder, an investor, and the first customer. He told me no for like, he kept telling me no for three months, 
like you were saying, like this product is crappy, I already have this competitor's product, it's working. It's, but I, I, I never gave it up, actually, with the advice from Zal. He, he told me, like, just if we land that customer, then we're going to land anyone because we got like 10 no's. He was very rude to me, like telling me, don't, don't write me anymore. But finally, I signed him up. So whatever it took me, and I signed him up for free. Like they, they are, even today, they are paying like one third of the price that everybody else is paying because they were the first guy. We, we would experiment everything. We would crash their system for like 10 times a day. But they were okay with that because it was for free. They would not notice it sometimes. And that's how we grew. So the customer is the best source for you to grow your company. And whatever customer tells you, the critics that you get from them is the best source of learning. Sometimes you may not like it, but your best source of learning is uh, negative feedback from, from your customers. So whatever it takes, just get your first customer and do whatever they want. Like you sometimes may build something else for them to keep them for the product that you want them to be there. But that is very critical because that helps you learn faster and learn those things that are really necessary because there are other customers who, who have the same need and you just need to learn that from them directly. Um, so just one detail, uh, when we were, when we finished our product and when when we decided, okay, so probably it's time to sell, COVID hit the market and car dealerships started to close. So like the market that we were targeting was shutting down. So I was like, okay, probably I should go home <laughs> because w what can I do? But then we figured out that like not all dealerships were closing and some dealerships were closing because they could not pay their employees because of uh, lower sales because of customers, because of employees wanting to and being uh, asked to work from home. So they were having these problems. So what we did was that we made a press release of giving out our software for 90 days for free to help dealers deal with the crisis. And we signed up our first 10 customers that way. Like after this first customer on which we were experimenting, we needed more customers. So we thought we would sell, but we could not. So we gave it up for free. And for those 90 days, on every day, we, were, we would call the dealer and ask them, like, what do you don't like? What is the, how is it working? Is it good? Is it bad? What do you would like to change? And at the end of the 90 days, we added all of those features that they were talking about, and 100% of the free customers converted into a paying customer, which is kind of not, not, not an unusual thing um, in any industry. Like, and, and it's not like paying nothing and paying $5. It was paying nothing and paying $1,000 afterwards. But the way we collected their feedback and the way we uh, reacted on that was the main source of how we grew our company. So that was a kind of growth hacking thing that we did back in there to give it out for free, collect the feedback, and then tell them that, okay, you have to pay for it. And they were paying for it because everything they needed was in the product. So get your first customer because that's going to be the best source of learning for you. And finally, um, one thing which is very specific when you're trying to build business from Georgia you can build pretty good product if you identify a problem there. You can build pretty good product here, but you may not be able to find how to sell it because it's a totally different thing. Like to sell a product, it's, I don't know, like it's a natural thing sometimes when people have that skill for me. When I see, I, I, I'm not a bad salesperson because I like, managed to raise money, I managed to sign up some customers, but to sell it at scale, it takes you time. And for that time, you need money. So we were running out of money, and one of the strategies that we had was to just sign up some resellers because they're going to see us, and if they like our product, then they're going to make us an offer, right? Because that will be a source for them to grow their existing business. So if you can't find the way how to sell it, if you can't find a good sales team, because good sales team needs a lot of money, just go ahead and find some other companies that are targeting the same businesses and same companies as their customers and tell them to try your product, to sell it to them 
And whenever they get good feedback from them, they're going to come back to you. First, they're going to help you sell and pay you fees, whatever you need. And then if they are seeing that this feedback is keeps coming, the positive feedback, they're going to buy you for sure. That's the case for Pulsar. We signed up this reseller. They were asking us to give them exclusivity, but we didn't do so because we knew that like if we give them exclusivity, they're going to they're not going to buy us for those for that time because they won't need it. They have the product to sell. We're not allowed to sell. They are selling, so they're going to make money whatever they can. So why would they buy us? So we told them no, and they still wanted to become our resellers. They became, and right after like two or three customer signups and feedback that they got, they came to us with an offer to, to buy the company because they were seeing that the more customers they would sign up for us with our product, even though they were getting cash, our company would become more and more expensive for them, right? So that's why in a very short time we managed to exit our company because after closing our, like after 11 months of closing our investment round, we had an offer on the table to, to sell the company. It took us some time to uh, triple that offer for us with the negotiations, but uh, but we we had an offer pretty pretty soon. So I think that it's a pretty good strategy to go to B two B and find a reseller because they're gonna see you, and if you're really having a strong product, they will definitely uh, look at you as a potential addition to their uh, to their company, and they will acquire you. Uh, if it's not them, then there's going to be quite many others who will be looking at you as a potential growth, uh, growth uh, way of growth for them. Uh, that said, good luck to everyone with the. I'm I'm happy to share anything else. Also, you can add me on LinkedIn or Facebook. I'm I'm always pretty open to any discussions because I'm really a fan of the. Thing that I'm doing, not only the AI stuff, but the entrepreneurship is what, what kind of I'm. I'm really enjoying doing things, and I'm mostly enjoying starting things from scratch. That's the moment when I really, when I'm really excited with it. When the company starts to make money, it's kind of okay. Let's move to the next thing. So, um, good luck, and yeah, I'm here for questions now. Thank you. Much uh, touchy. Indeed, let's open the floor for questions. And I see the first hand here, please. Yeah, thanks again for sharing. My first question is, was your exit cash exit? We, we uh, had a mix of cash and stock. We pushed within the negotiation, we pushed for more stock because the company is growing pretty fast. The valuation that they gave us offer on is kind of half of what they really have. Uh, so we were pushing them to give us more stock, but it became kind of half to half. N not really, not exactly half to half, but we made cash and stock. And now, so every shareholder that had stock in Pulsar, mm -hmm. um, investors had an option to take all cash or roll it out to the stock of Spincar. And um, all the shareholders, co-founders, uh, and uh, the team uh, got both cash and stock. And to to actually mention, uh, it, it was uh, what was the name? Va Vazden, Vazden? Vazden. Yeah, Vazgen. So he he mentioned giving equity to to your employees, right? So that's what we did. I'm, I'm really proud of uh, that move that all of the executive team made um, uh, together. We gave uh, to. I know like almost 15 uh, employees of our company, we gave them equity. Uh, in the beginning, they, they were thinking that when I was telling them to sign this paper, I was trying to negotiate them on the salary because like I'm, I'm not going to pay you that much, but I'm giving you stock and they would never understand why, like, why would they take this stock, what's the use of that. But today you can't find a parking spot in our, <laughs> at our office. <laughs> because all of them made quite a good, good amount of money out of this stock. So now when they go out and tell their friends that they had stock in the startup and they made quite a good amount of money, some of them bought apartments, some of them bought cars, 
So now probably others will see that it's worth to have a startup stock and not only get paid, they may pay you less, but the money you're gonna make and the stock that you have can constantly grow it w with with the more dedication you give in that. So that's, yeah, yeah that's sorry great. for no, <laughs> no, it's, too long. It's great to hear that. The second question I have, so if I understand correctly, Pulsar AI is uh, now the product within this company, right? So you keep the brand or how does it work? Uh, uh, yes, but Pulsar AI is not just one product because of it's it kind of added a new um, direction within the company, which is conversational AI. And in the beginning, when we joined them, we had this one product which would help you automate sales, like customers are trying to buy the car and they're sending you questions, so we, we would automate that. But today, we have also the product that reaches out to customers who bought vehicle from you to bring them back for the car service. So this is another product. Now we are adding another product which helps you sell financing and insurance products to the customer. So it's a whole new direction for the company. Um, today, our products have the highest margin within the company and average uh, revenue per customer that the company was collecting has tripled since we got acquired by them. So. It is uh, yes and no, but also they added this AI capabilities to their development because recently uh, our team became even more integrated within Spincar. Uh, we took roles, I took the chief innovation officer role of Spincar itself. Uh, Zal and Sopa took VP of engineering and operations. So right now we are running all innovations for Spincar. And uh, this is another huge advantage that we have in the country because uh, Spincar has office in New York uh, of like the development office is in New York City and we're adding more and more people here to actually decrease the cost that they're having for the development because they see that the skill set that we have here is not lower quality than they have there and we are growing pretty fast and we are adding more and more things that will be developed from Georgia, not only AI. And my last question, if it's not a secret, of course, what was the valuation? It is actually a secret because... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's, it's been... Uh, You're happy. Sorry? You're yeah, happy. I'm pretty happy. Not only me, but every, every, every other investor every shareholder, so yeah, it's been quite quite huge thing for us. Um, I can, what I can say is like, I was told it's okay to say it's tens of millions of dollars. That's how I can <laughs> share, but not the exact number. You don't know how many tens, but several tens. Uh, and, and actually speaking of that, because again, I've prepared this question for you and it's a tough one, it's not a softball, and of course you have the right not to answer it. But you elaborated on the, investors perspective like the spin cars how they decided to make the acquisition right because they saw that the product works they saw happy customers and they recognized that your valuation will only grow but what was your perspective like why did you exit wasn't it too early or like if it was only cash only deal you would refuse yeah that's i agree that's a tough one uh so one of the signals that we were seeing on the market was that competition was becoming harder and harder for us because bigger companies were adding this thing to their thing. And for example, we integrate with CRMs to, to be able to communicate with their customers and CRMs started to add AI assistance within their software. So we saw that as a potential threat, one. Number two was that we were already getting close to run out of cash, even though we were already generating revenue, we were not at a break even point, and we would need to raise another round. And at the point where we were at the moment was that we would need to raise quite substantial amount of money in order to build a good sales team, uh, an experienced one uh, within the industry, which would cost us a lot of money, which by itself meant that we would need to give out equity again. And that by itself meant that in two or three years after raising this money, 
we would need to sell our company at least four or five times the value that we already were being offered. So with the offer, with the guarantee that they would keep our team during all of the earn out period, with all of the benefits that they offered us, and with all of the super, super fast growth and learnings that we're getting, we figured out that it was much better to uh, make exit uh, now. And we also, all of us made quite a lot of money, so <laughs> we were pretty happy with that. Thank you so much. I feel very similar problems here. And my last question is, unless we have other questions in the audience, so my last question will be, like you, 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 your, one of your recommendations was target any big industry that needs a tech shift. So what other industry besides automotive would you recommend the Georgian startups or like you know, the first time founders, young people to look at? Yeah, there are industries that have been there, are there and will be there probably forever, like automotive, even though the product changes, like we're shifting more to the electric vehicles, but still we need that mode of transportation, right? So that industry is growing and it's gonna be there always. There are other industries like healthcare, there are real estate, hospitality, all of those industries that are huge and we think that are not gonna disappear in the next two or three decades, then everybody's interested to invest in those. So, but probably should just go and see what, like, what are the top 10 industries in US economy and just pick two or three of those and start researching there. Some of them have better adoption of technology. It's harder to enter those ones, but some of the industries are far, far behind from them. That's, that's the place to start. Is re like relevantly conservative, orthodox, traditional? Yes. Tough one. Even though it has made a huge step forward because of COVID, because it just forced the industry to do that. Like, industry is was ten years behind, and now it's catching up with everything. There are still a bunch of possibilities out there because. Car dealerships, there are like 30,000 of them. They're spending on average like up to $30,000 for software as a services, all, all the software that they're getting uh, per month. And, uh, and the industry still needs, to, still needs to improve at many, many aspects. So there are a bunch of possibilities there. Happy to, happy to discuss it with anyone interested in it. All right. Thanks again. Thanks for the insights. Thank and you. of course, thanks for uh, your readiness to help the next generation. Thank you so much. Thank you.